This is Twit. Uh, there was a chatbot designed to help eating disorders. Mm -hmm. uh, they fired the entire uh, team that was uh, uh, on this hotline. Uh, the, uh, the NEDA, the National Eating Disorders Association, uh, had a website where people would go to get information about uh, eating disorders and what to do to fight them. They decided, eh, we don't need people. Let's just get a bot named Tessa. Tessa started giving people dieting advice, which is exactly what you don't give somebody who's suffering from an eating disorder. Um, that's just an example of, to me, over-promoting the, the, the potential of AI. I don't think AI is all that. I really don't. Well, it, Leo, it may have potential. But, it but may, that potential but that could, something may happen in the Nita future. Nita was fooled by now. these stories, and I think as a media organization, it's our responsibility to tell people, no, a chatbot should not be giving advice on eating disorders. Why would you even think that? Well, it's, I, it's the reason why I don't rely on autopilot on my Tesla, although I do believe we will reach a day someday when cars can safely drive themselves. We just aren't there yet. But we need to be experimenting and building it to get to that point. So, you know, the, the question is, you know, should we be drinking the Kool-Aid this quickly as opposed to simply supporting the fact that research and experimentation needs to happen with the appropriate warnings and, and safeguards? Okay, we can all we agree have to, to that. think yeah. about the whole the, the whole I mean, the, the employment uh, angle to it is really going to be key. Uh, big business wants A.I., in substantial part to get rid of human right. labor. That is the fundamental driving force behind uh, a lot of corporate and expensive adoption labor. of AI. And that, 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 that this, is, uh, this is nirvana. You, you can get a ret higher return on capital by getting rid of these annoying humans who it's, need health care, who need money. Uh, it's it's like, and we, we if we don't really focus on a lot on that as part of this and, and put that not just in sort of, by the way, they got the reason this idiot chatbot was giving bad advice is that they wanted to get rid of people. Right. 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 And, and, and but make that really clearer and louder. And the other thing about uh, we've been using AI in, making decisions for now a number of years in other contexts it's now just starting to affect uh the, the white middle class right. uh in a profound way when people have been having decisions made about them and for them ba with ai augmented tools for years including redlining of mortgages uh health care decisions who gets a job all sorts of stuff. Oh, and we didn't give a damn about any of them, or we didn't give enough of a damn. And suddenly it's hitting us. Oh, gosh, this is really dangerous. Yeah, that's a really yep. good point. All the uh, job hunting sites have uh, offered AI help in screening out candidates, which ended up, of course, to disproportionately affect people of color and other minorities. Um, yeah, I mean, this has been going on for years. Uh, Why I mean, totally. I mean, I mean, if, if you if you substitute AI for automation, which I know they're not exactly interchangeable, but in many ways, that's how these things are being used. Yeah, um, I, I think Dan, I think you're exactly right. Th these things and these algorithms have been used in very um, negative ways, both for for screening people for for loans as a, as a great example. Um, uh, for for job stuff, it could, could potentially be bad. That's why it's important that there are ethics boards, um, and and you know, hopefully. Um, yeah. non you know biased parties looking at these things i'm sure you have the best health care in the world because you work at microsoft but honestly i know that our health care is very much influenced by i wouldn't call it ai uh oh I, no but, but i think but it's, the it's actuarial it's actuarial tables totally. are, are a th extinction level threat to mankind because they're just looking at statistics it's the same thing we can't get earthquake insurance in in california no uh, i mean and look i i like I, my parents who are, you know, um, in their seventies, you know, I, but are healthy. I see the way that they are treated by doctors based on certain things. Didn't need AI to do account. that. Yeah. No, not at all. But, but they are using, but, but AI will be used 
in some diagnostics criteria. And in some cases that might actually be useful, right? Like in some cases I could see that that might actually be useful than the current model, which is that you have people who, if you are over a certain age, will immediately look at you or a certain gender or a certain race, will immediately dismiss any of your concerns and will just make a diagnostic based on, you know, um, what, whatever they, they, they plugged into something. Um, whereas if something's more complex, potentially some of these systems could help, but no, you're not wrong. I mean, like, even when you have good healthcare, getting, you know, doctors to actually listen to you is very difficult. Yeah. Well, we have to do that. We have to ration healthcare. We don't have enough. It's expensive. Right. And uh, wow. we can't all get good healthcare. You know, only the rich, I guess. Hmm. Well, if we took away that uh, massive portion of the spending that's going to insurance companies uh, mm -hmm. for the sole purpose of not giving us healthcare, uh, maybe we'd be able to afford more. I don't know. Call me crazy. Yeah. Well, the other thing about healthcare is, I mean, the, the more I've experimented with various, you know, tools to do diagnostics, the more skeptical I get about the accuracy of diagnostic testing. I mean, certain things are obvious, like you could take an x-ray and see a cancer maybe, but other things like sleep apnea, they, it, it, it's a lot of, I don't know, I don't, wouldn't call it pseudoscience, but approximation of determining what what constitutes a an illness and what doesn't. And there's just a lot we don't know. Obviously, the COVID situation was one where we went through three years of kind of guessing. We were talking earlier off camera about you know washing our hands and washing our vegetables and things that we were led to believe by very credible, knowledgeable, well-meaning scientists were the right thing to do, not because they were trying to fool us or manipulate us, but because they just didn't know. And yeah. and there's still a lot we don't know. Yeah. Third, it's estimated that, it's, that thirty percent of our healthcare spending goes to administrative costs. Yeah. That's a significant portion. Yeah. Uh, Larry, the scientific process is something to celebrate, of yeah. course. And yeah, we made a lot of mistakes early on, and so did people we should have, who should have done a better job. World Health Organization being one of the top ones, but uh, different than sort of willful. Oh, of course. Yeah. Uh, misinformation along the way. There was, I think, I, though, I, and I don't know for a fact, but I've seen it said that there was some bias also because the medical uh, establishment had for so many centuries fought off the miasma theory of illness that you got sick because of bad air. They were very, very reluctant to say that this disease was caused by aerosolized particles. And, and it was, that's a bias, right? That's a, that's not scientific method. That's like, oh no, we don't want to go there. And um, that's a good example of where the scientific method can be overruled. By well, I think it's part of the scientific method is, is studying and restudying and reinvestigating it. I mean, why are drugs pulled off the market besides the political ones like, uh, you know, the, the abortion pill? But most drugs that are pulled off the market are because subsequent research has proven that they are less helpful uh, than or they are more harmful than helpful. And, and that's part of the scientific process. And it didn't mean it was it was foolish for us to have taken those drugs when we believed they were helpful. Right. But it just means that we had incomplete. We were basing those decisions on what later turned out to be incomplete information. Yeah. And, and that's what's sort of scary to me when I think about all of the decisions that I make as a healthcare consumer based on what is clearly incomplete information. So do you think this is a place AI could help? I do, yes. eventually. Yeah, I'm, I, I think AI can make is gonna be great at making connections that we otherwise right. um, might not that's, spot. That's what it seems the best yeah. at, yeah. And, and, totally. and it has been, we've seen things being used that way. Uh, the issue, as in that test uh, that you were just getting results from, is drawing definitive conclusions right. from connections where, uh, you know, the classic uh, correlation is not causation. And, right. and we sorting out the difference. I mean, I think AI could give us all kinds of wonderful things to investigate further. Well, we know one be. area that's huge is protein folding, where uh, AI is so much faster and so much more effective and has really been solving a problem uh, that is going to have a significant uh, impact on health care. Um, this is from Science Magazine. The game has changed. 
AI triumphs at protein folding. Remember folding at home where yep. you, you, yes. could, you could devote a portion of your computer, idle computer time oh, right. to solving yeah. these folding problems? AI has already done more than all folding at home over the years put together. I th I, yeah, I think the SETI, which was one of the things like it shut down last year, actually. Um, but yeah, it, that that that's a great example of, yeah. of where AI yeah. is very, very useful. Yeah. So I'm not I'm not saying AI is useless. Uh, I'm saying the, ch the, ch the large language models are <laughs> for the most part seem to be uh, bullshit generators. Um, but I, I think the large lot language model, though, if they have the right database underlying them, can be useful. And I think they can, in, in healthcare, they can be useful also in doing the things that a lot of doctors do today, which is to take a bunch of information and make a conclusion as to what the best course of action is. Yeah. And that's based essentially on actual intelligence. The doctor knows this and that and has this data and makes this conclusion. But with an AI system that has access to a huge amount of data, assuming the data is accurate, it might be able to make a better recommendation than, than a typical human doctor could, especially once you get out of the big cities, when you got the big universities, you know, you get into places where you can't get the world's greatest doctors. If you can get AI that can simulate that kind of intelligent uh, diagnosis, it could benefit humankind. Hey, I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief of Ad Astra Magazine, and each week I join with my co-host to bring you This Week in Space, the latest and greatest news from the final frontier. We talk to NASA chiefs, space scientists, engineers, educators, and artists, and sometimes we just shoot the breeze over what's hot and what's not in space, books, and TV. And we do it all for you, our fellow true believers. So whether you're an armchair adventurer or waiting for your turn to grab a slot in Elon's Mars rocket, join us on This Week in Space and be part of the greatest adventure of all time.